SFUSD. That's the place to be. SFUSD. Bienvenidos at the Juan Ying. SFUSD. Everyone come and see. SFUSD. Join our family. Good. Welcome to SF Loves Learning. Um, so we have some questions for you today. Are you ready to get started? We're ready. Ready and able. Yes. All right. So my first two, or first question is a two-parter, and it is: What do you do, and why is it important? Well, what we do, in a nutshell, is find blight and turn it into beauty, and Meaning we look for areas locally here in the Bayview that have been either neglected in terms of uh, caring and, and uh, responsible stewardship of the land, and we rehabilitate it. We bring in native plants, we rebuild the soil, we invite the animals to return, and thereby bringing balance, creating balanced ecosystems. Why is that important, though? Well, honestly, let's go through a few reasons. Number one, anybody ever hear of drought? That happens a lot of times because, well, if you see a bare piece of dirt, you look at on the ground, you, you see a spot where there's no grass, there's nothing growing. Usually that means the ground is so compacted, it's so hard that when it does rain, the little bit of rain that drops doesn't permeate, meaning the water doesn't go down deep into the ground and it evaporates. So when you have a balanced ecosystem, you're going to have to have good living soil. And we use the term porosity, meaning how porous uh, an object is. And porous just means the ability for water to penetrate. And so when you have more porous soil, you have more water retention thereby lessening the bad effects of drought. That's one reason we want a good ecosystem. The other reason is, yeah, you might not know, have a lot of mosquitoes here, but sometimes, some places you do, or another kind of pest, or a lot of flies, or a lot of gnats. Whenever you have a lot of something, especially pests or insects, and I don't want to use the word pest, but insects, that means something's out of balance. And the way you balance that is you bring in biodiversity. You make the area as diverse as possible. And then when you have balance, you won't have uh, an abundance or overabundance of a particular pest because there'll be another insect that interacts with this in the food chain and uh, everything is a lot smoother. That's, those are just two reasons that you want a balanced ecosystem. We could talk about diseases. Now, microbes they're all around us and what we're beginning to understand as scientists is that microbes and every living thing have a relationship and you know in the bayview um you know it's 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 in san francisco it's city it's uh we don't get to see a lot of open spaces before a long time ago there were i mean you could go back and it's actually really cool to go back and look at old pictures of the Bayview of San Francisco and see open space and see how it's um, how it's changed um, since you know the last 150 years. So you know 150 years ago, 200 years ago, the whole uh, environment was very very different, and you had very different animals there and uh, amphibians and insects and large carnivores and. You had, you had more animals, you had more uh, diversity in there. Now humans have come in and they have either pushed out or, um, you know, or divided, um, you know, which is called population fragmentation when um, different populations of animals, butterflies, whatever they are, are fragmented. They're just, they're too far apart. And eventually those populations dwindle and die out. Um, or you have, um, you know, like I'm sure you guys have seen coyotes, right? You, uh, we're hearing about coyotes coming in um, again. 
Um, and, you know, they were almost success successfully exterminated from San Francisco. Why? Uh, fear. You know, a lot of people were fearful of them. They wanted to just get rid of all of the, the predators. And so when they did that, then there was a rise in the prey species. So again, going back to what Isaiah was saying is once you throw something off balance, it's not good. It's not good. Um, so, you know, we're trying to just uh, bring diversity back to the Bayview. And to add on to that, okay, why the coyotes? Because of habitat destruction. Okay. So I have one final question, and this one is, what can other young San Francisco scientists do to also help restore habitats in our city? Well, the first thing they can do, I, I would say, is do and grow something. Buy some seeds, or you can buy some potatoes from your local grocery store. Find out how to plant the potatoes. Find out the growth cycle of a potato. That's what I chose that. It's one of the easier things to uh, grow. You know, you cut it up, you put it in the ground, eyes facing up. A few months later, you'll see uh, uh, cotadillion. Then you'll, the stalk will grow, leaves. Then they'll turn yellow, it'll die back. And then you pull up and then, wow, I have a, a fistful of little potatoes. So you gotta do. You have to do some reading and a lot of doing. And you have the computer, you have the internet, use that, you know, use these tools, have questions. A scientist has questions. A scientist, they are already born with a whole lot of questions in them. So it's their duty to find answers to these questions. Um, learn by doing. And talking about habitats, observe as well. Go out into your neighborhoods and Bayview is a great place because you have you still have a, a lot of uh, pristine environment here. A lot of places where you can observe trees, you can observe butterflies, insects, birds. Observe and then do experiments such as grow. Growing is a great way to experiment. You can see what works, what's promoting growth, uh, and you don't need a lot of space to begin with. You could uh, use your windowsill if you get a lot of sun. If you have even a little space in the front or in back, you can do that go out into the forests. Yeah, I'm, you know, you could go easily to, there's a lot of parks in the Bayview. You can go visit the community gardens. And I think, you know, uh, a lot of kids nowadays have phones. So I think a really cool, um, you know, activity is to go for a walk and to go bring your phone and bring um, or bring a, um, a little art pad and a pencil and sit somewhere and either take a picture of a flower that you, that you find really beautiful and play around with the filters, you know, see, um, make it, turn it into art. Thank you both so much for doing this interview with us on SS Love Learning. And I really hope that all three of us will see more scientists running around and restoring habitat. So thank you again. And thank you for the wonderful tips on how we can be better scientists and help take care of our world. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Jade. <laughs> see ya. Hello, friends. Mr. Ryther here. Do you have a favorite kind of animal? Do you know where they live? Different animals live in different habitats. Some live in oceans, some live in deserts, some live in forests. Some animals have become endangered because their habitats are disappearing. This provides us all an opportunity to be heroes to these animals by learning everything we can about the animal and taking action to protect their habitats, to protect their homes. Today's song is called Animal Homes, and joining me on today's song are Aiden Lewis and Beezy Lewis. Imagine you were a rabbit hopping through the world. The fox comes, you have a habit of diving in your burrow. Everybody needs a place to hide when danger comes around. And for the rabbit, it's 
a burrow underground. Thank you, Aiden. Thank you, BZ, for joining me on that song. And my friends watching at home, what can you do to learn more about your favorite animal? And what actions can you take to protect their habitat? Hello, boys and girls. Happy Black History Month. I'm Mrs. Marshall. We talked earlier, earlier this month as well. I'm here in my office. I call this the Barack Obama wall. I should say President. Barack Obama. Look at the lovely picture of President Obama there. And I call this is the actual wall here. I am partial to that picture because I brought it back to California from Washington, D.C. at his inauguration. My family and I went to Washington, D.C. twice to see him being sworn in as the first African American man to be elected president of these United States of America. When we went, boys and girls, it was so cold cold, 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 about 20 degrees. We had on a heavy coat, a hat, a scarf, mittens, and I learned about hand warmers and help keep your, keep your hand warm. We were up at their, what they call MARTA, we call it BART here, about 3 a.m. California time in order to get to the inauguration on time. Hundreds and thousands of people, everyone behaved well. It was so awesome, so wonderful. So this is President Barack Obama when he got married to First Lady Michelle Obama. Another picture of the Obamas here with Dr. King. Uh, their pictures here. And look at this picture here, boys and girls. They're showcasing President Obama. They're surrounded by all the presidents of the United States. I like this picture because it is there uh, after he was sworn in that day. At nighttime, they had a great big party where everyone got dressed up. This is the inaugural, one of the inauguration pictures. But I also want to talk to you today about the African American Honor Roll. Oh, this is a holiday of my help from my teammates and I are here working on the Honor Roll. And I want to show you this piece of cloth. It's called a Kenton cloth, K-E-N-T-E. -E. Our students who earn a 4.0 will receive this Kenton cloth uh, this week, next week rather. And it's, you see the letters here. You, can, you, you know these letters, Paho, so maybe. This is what, an S, an F, an A, a B, S E. It's, these are called acronyms when letter stands for word. And it means the San Francisco Alliance of Black School Educators. And on the back, look boys and girls, on the back of the Kenta Claw, it says the words, words on a roll. So students who are in grades six through 12, who earn a 4.0 or who are African American will receive this Kenta Claw. And everyone will receive a medallion. 
And a mom called me just a few moments ago. She said, I'm looking forward to my son receiving his medallion at the honor roll ceremony this week. So again, if you're 4.0, you receive this one. It's a lamp of knowledge. And then everyone else will receive. This is the elementary one, and this is a middle and high school medallion. There are about 1,500 students in our school district who have earned a 3.0 grade point average or higher. And in addition to that, boys and girls, every student will receive this red ribbon. And it says what? On a roll on it. And all the adults who are help, helping us will receive this uh, ribbon as well. And they get many other, other goodies because we want to keep encouraging them. So we want you to uh, stay focused on your grades, listen to mom and dad and your teachers. And then when you are uh, 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 at one of our ceremonies um, in a few years, the Mrs. Marshall, I came to get my Kenton cloth because I am now a 4.0 student. Thank you, boys and girls. Happy Black History Month. Bye-bye. Hi, my name is Jay, and I'm a teacher on SF. Loves learning. And today I'll be teaching a new version of Clash. You probably remember my other version of Clash, which was the Clash to use one digit. But this time, we're going to add the lower number to the higher number and make one big number. So, you're going to need th two materials. First, you're going to need a deck of cards. Take the kings and the jacks, and then the queens are zeros, aces are ones. And the second material you need is a partner. I have Vivian here. Hello. Let's begin. First, we put down two cards. Second of all, you count them. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I have ten total. And I have four, five, six, seven. So I have seven and Jay has ten. That means I won the I got more than seven, so that means I get all the cards. Let's do one more round. Two cards down. I got a six and a five. Six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11. I have 11 total. And I have a 7, but then I have a queen, which is a 0, remember? So I have 7 plus 0 is just 7. I get it again, because I got, I got higher than 7. That's how we play Clash, a different version, and you can play it all the time at home. And see you again on SF Love Learning. Bye-bye. Hey, hola, bonjour, nehoma, aloha, dancers. It's me, Miss Mora, with San Francisco Ballet's Dance in Schools and Communities program. And today I am so excited to introduce to you one of my dance heroes, my hero alice that's right i've been working on a dance my hero alice you want to try it with me my hero alice yes alice shepherd alice shepherd is one of my dance heroes and i'm really excited to tell you about her and to use our bodies to explore ideas about what it is to be a hero and what that means to you. So get yourselves ready. Come on, let's go. Alice Shepard is a dancer and choreographer. Ooh, I like that word. It's big. Can we clap it out? Chore. 
videographer. Give it a try yourself. Do you know what that is? A choreographer is a person who makes dances and puts all the parts of them together. And Alice Shepard is a dancer and choreographer. I'll show you a picture of her. Alice Shepard is a dancer who is disabled and uses a wheelchair and sometimes crutches. She is a black woman who is from Britain, which is England, which is in Europe. And she has danced here in the Bay Area with Axis Dance Company and toured all over the world. And that's a little bit about my hero, Alice. Now, maybe you're wondering, why is she a hero to me? What makes a hero a hero? Well, to me, a hero means courage, or as my teachers used to tell me, courage. That's right. What does courage mean to you? Courage is the strength and ability to do things that are difficult and sometimes even frighten you. So can we take some big, deep breaths, filling ourselves with courage? Let's breathe in and fill up with courage. And as we breathe out, can we link our courage together, making it so strong? Now I wanna share with you not one, not two, but three ways I think Alice Shepard shows her courage. And I invite you to move your bodies along with me any way you prefer. And first, Alice Shepard was all the way grown up when she took her first dance class on a dare. That's right, someone dared her. It was new for her. And trying something new can be scary. Can you try a new and scary pose? How about a daring pose? Second, Alice Shepard shows her courage by being different and unique. Can you find a shape that is different or unique? Alice Shepard changes people's minds about what disability and dance and disability and art, what it is and what just being an excellent dancer is. Try something different. And the third, way that my hero Alice shows courage is that she fights for justice. She is also a disabled activist who uses her dancing and her voice to speak out and to educate people about the needs and rights of disabled people and to lift the voices of people who need to be heard. Now, how does fighting for justice move in your body? Thank you so much, dancers, for joining today and exploring what it is to be a hero with your body as we learned about Alice Shepard. And I think I forgot to say earlier that she is a multiracial black dancer. Multiracial meaning many races and black as well. And she is on a list of 100 heroes right now, the YBCA 100 with our very own Miss Jessica. That's right. And because we created this dance today about being a hero, we can say we can create a dance that expresses an idea. Okay, dancers, Miss Mora out. School may look different this year, but that didn't stop the students in San Francisco from learning at home. Kids at our schools didn't worry that it's hard to learn new things. They were excited they could grow as students. They used technology to connect, learn, and push the boundaries of what is possible. Digital Learning Week is San Francisco Unified School District's annual celebration of innovative digital learning practices. Let's celebrate some of these SFUSD All-Stars. Luna Castello is a third grade student in a Spanish bilingual classroom at Daniel Webster. Her class used the power of words to share stories about themselves. 
Her story was about learning how to play piano. It was hard at first, but now she looks forward to piano lessons. She started by thinking about a small moment. Then her teacher helped her step by step to write it out with Google Docs. When she was done, she had a story that teaches readers the importance of overcoming challenges. Luna says, I love reading and I like writing because I can tell a story. At first, it's hard to get started on my own stories, but when I focus and put effort into it, I'm always happy with how it turns out. Writing might feel like a challenge while learning from home, but like Luna says, stick with it because the hardest part might just be getting started. What do you want to write about at home? Students at Jefferson Elementary School didn't let distance learning stop them from learning about books. While at home, they made their own short movies for the 92nd Newberry Film Festival. The Newberry is an award given to authors by the Library Association for writing amazing children's books. Students read Newberry award-winning books in groups called literature circles. They then wrote plot summaries, brainstormed different ways to tell the stories, and what could make the stories better. Once they understood their Newberry books very well, they made their own short 90-second movies and shared them with each other and entered an online film festival for kids. It is always more fun to learn with your friends and make something together. Teachers wanted to help their students be successful too. Ms. Caligaros loves teaching kids about how to use technology. She recorded herself using a computer program called Screencastify. Students could see her and what they were supposed to do on their computers, so they felt just like they were back in a classroom. Here we see her showing her students how to write their own computer program using BeBots. So to all of the teachers who made learning possible for students during this historic and unprecedented school year, we appreciate all that you do for students. SF loves teachers. Hello, I'm Superintendent Dr. Vincent Matthews of the San Francisco Unified School District. It made me so happy to spend time with you today. I hope you had fun too. And now it's time to say goodbye. So let's sing our goodbye song. For this song, you have to use your whole body. Will you sing it with me? Are you ready? Wave high, wave low. For now, it's time to go. Wave your elbows, wave your toes, wave your tongue, and wave your nose. Wave your knees, wave your lips. Blow a kiss with your fingertips. Wave your ears, wave your hair, wave your belly and wave your derriere. Wave your chin, wave your eye, for now it's time to say goodbye. Bye bye. SFUSD, that's the place to be. SFUSD, bienvenidos at the Juan Ying. SFUSD. Everyone come and see SFUSD Join our family